This is an ordinary one-shot color planetary camera. This particular model is the Player One Uranus C, and it only costs in the range of $400. These cameras are becoming extraordinarily powerful, capable of resisting noise of all kinds, including dead pixels and damp glow, and becoming so effective at it that they barely need cooling at all. And last week we examined how these cameras have become so powerful that they can approach the capabilities of much more expensive color and monochrome cameras with filter sets. In fact, from this one-shot camera, we got this image, the majestic Cygnus wall. This is it in true color as perceived by a one-shot camera and the human eye. And we covered how to modify the colors perceived by the camera and create the contrasting colorful beauty recorded by monochrome cameras with narrowband filters. The technique I shared with you at the time was the manual way, dividing up the image into several layers, determining color values for each layer, and adjusting contrast and brightness on a luminance layer, then recompositing all those layers again. That technique is labor intensive, but it works pretty well and gives some beautiful results with a little practice. But what if there was a much more effective way? A way to make post-processing software sensitive to the slightest differences in hues of light recorded by a one-shot color camera so that a one-shot color image could better interpret the light emitted or reflected by the substances in space and then transform those frequencies into alternative colors to emulate things like the Hubble palette and give very good representations that one might only see with a narrowband camera complete with expensive narrowband filters. Well, if you could do that, then you wouldn't really need a monochrome camera and filter wheel set or cooling at all, would you? I have news for you. There is a way. Because the capabilities of one-shot color cameras and the software to develop the images they produce have come a long way. Here, you are seeing NGC 7000 or the Cygnus wall portrayed in the Hubble palette, complete with stars made in this case with a Player One Uranus C, an ordinary uncooled color camera, and done in such a way that it is very close to the accuracy of a cooled monochrome camera with narrowband filters. No cooling to manage noise, and that cuts out as much as half the price of the camera, and no narrowband filters or filter wheel, and that's about as much as the cost of a camera. And in today's episode, I'm going to show you some very simple, straightforward techniques that will allow you to get into astrophotography much more affordably and regardless of myths that you must have a cooled camera, possibly with a filter wheel, produce some absolutely stunning results. To make this technique work, you're going to need data from a modern one-shot color camera. I'm fond of the Player Ones because they have excellent dead pixel suppression and amp glow suppression, and they are truly marvelous at resisting other kinds of noise. So once again, we are looking at the Cygnus Wall NGC 7000. And we're going to begin by running the Image Solver script, which we will apply later in photometric color calibration. The process is pretty straightforward. You open the Image Solver, open the search feature under Search Parameters, enter the catalog designation of the target, and then click OK. The Image Solver will look up the parameters for that particular target, and then you can apply its results to any script or process afterward that might require those parameters. Once the image solver is done, we are then going to run spectrophotometric color calibration. It is the newest and generally most accurate way of doing color calibration within PixInsight. Usually the default settings on this process are fine, and as we have already play solved with the image solver, it's simply a matter of operating the process. Once that portion of the process is done, we're going to check the stars to see if there's any residual green tinting. There probably will be since we're using an OSC color camera. And yep, we can see some green tinting there. We can easily remove that with the SCNR function. So we'll go ahead and open up the SCNR process, run it, it only takes a moment. And we can see now those stars are nicely color balanced. Now, what we're going to have to do is remove the stars from this image because stars are quite bright compared to deep sky objects. If we left the stars in the image while we increase the brightness of the nebula, 
the stars would become so bright that they would either clip, meaning just become white without any detail, or they would outshine and overpower the subtler DSO object. With PixInsight, you can use StarNet, which is free, or you can use the Star Exterminator. Both work pretty well, but I have a bit of a preference for the Star Exterminator. I find that often on nebulous targets, Star Exterminator works a bit better. Regardless, the outcome won't be perfect, but we'll correct that later in another application. The Star Exterminator, by the way, has three forms of AI that you can use when removing stars. The AI Light generally does a pretty good job and it's fast, but I always prefer to run the full version. It takes a bit longer, but it does a better job. And since we're aiming for quality, I think it's worth taking a bit more time. It's going to take a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to skip on ahead to where the Star Exterminator is done. All right, the star exterminator is almost done. There it is. That's our star field. For the moment, we're just going to shrink that and set it aside. We're going to use it later, and when we use it, it won't be in PixInsight. There is actually a much better way to composite your stars back into an image, which I'll show you toward the end of this video when we get to that stage of image development. Now I'm going to run a couple processes that some persons find controversial, RC Astro's Noise Exterminator and Blur Exterminator. These processes use artificial intelligence to very effectively and selectively refine the detail in an image and non-destructively remove noise. The AI in the Blur Exterminator is somewhat controversial because some persons have argued it puts things in the image which are not there. Frankly, I haven't found this to be so. What it does is look for blurred objects that are there and reduces them in a manner similar to deconvolution. It's just very good at finding these objects. It reduces them, bringing them into a what appears to be a tighter focus, which overall makes them look better and in the image. And the noise exterminator applies artificial intelligence to identify objects that you don't want to dissolve in the process of noise removal. You see, ordinary noise removal tries to identify steady or strong signal and then removes unwanted faint pixels portraying chrominance or luminance in the surrounding area. This works well for bright objects here in the world, where there is so much light around us that the signals of desired objects is often very strong, allowing the software to fairly effectively pick out what is desired signal versus noise. But for deep sky objects, where we are working with weak signals to begin with, ordinary software struggles. I have found the noise exterminator to do a superb job of identifying what objects we want to keep and thereby what is noise and dissolving that noise. However, it's not perfect. And in a region like the Cygnus wall, where you have some very dim objects, such as all the dark lanes of stardust, the noise exterminator can blur those out as well. So I find that when running these two processes, it's a good idea to do the blur exterminator first. This sharpens things up and then run the noise exterminator, which will remove the extraneous undesired noise around everything. Now, with the blur and the noise dealt with, it's time to actually stretch our histogram and get the brightness of the subject up. We could do this manually, though I find that in PixInsight, the easy saw stretch works beautifully for almost everything. You can adjust it before you run it, or just run it and go back and run it again if you want, but almost always, I find the default settings work beautifully. After the easy saw stretch has done its job, we're then going to run a histogram transformation. At this point, we are going to manually adjust the brightness and the darkness of the object to the point that, well, I feel that it has the most visual appeal. Ultimately, our goal is to get the bright areas bright, but not washed out, and the dark areas dark, but not so dark, that subtle changes in the brightness of the shadows is lost. Those subtle changes show the depth and the thickness of the clouds, and if that's lost, it flattens the image, which is an undesirable composition characteristic. Making these adjustments is a manual process that has to be done differently with every single image. There's no one right way to do this right, but I can say to do it well, you should have a good monitor. I do my editing on a 4K HDR monitor with the video card calibrated to the specifics of this monitor so that the image that it portrays to my eye is as accurate as possible. Another principle is that when making your adjustments on the histogram, watch your waveforms and try not to clip them. Now with the histogram transformation and the HO script run, we're going to break out the curves tool and further adjust the brightness and contrast of the image. Our goal is to bring out just enough brightness to portray the image well and just enough darkness 
to make apparent and visually appealing the subtle shades of shadow and the dimension that shadow creates throughout the nebula. Once we have the brightness where we want it, we are going to turn to some scripts created by a brilliant fellow named Bill, who runs a channel called Another Astro Channel. He creates some remarkable scripts for the processing of imagery, both from mono and color cameras. You'll need his scripts in his NB normalization packet. He distributes them freely, and I have them linked below. So if using PixInsight, you should have the scripts open in your work area. Simply drag HOO normalization version 3 over your image. It's now going to work its magic. Now, deep sky nebulous objects tend to lean toward red, at least to the human eye. But there are other subtle hues of color within. Subtle hues that match up to the elements that reflected or emitted the light. The script will look for those subtle hues, develop them, and ultimately bring them out in the image, transforming the image in a way very similar to the way a narrowband image is created. By selectively portraying the hues hidden within the image, the hues that show the true nature of the elements of which the deep sky object is created. With the colors transformed, we'll work a bit more on our curves tool to refine the portrayal of light and shadow to maximize and beautify the contrast and dynamic range within the image. When that's done, we're going to address bringing out the colors. Once we have our curves adjusted, we're going to need more of Bill's tools. A package called Color Mask version 2, also linked below in the description. We're going to use the mask to divide up regions of the image and develop the rich and beautiful color to be found in each of those regions. We'll start out by developing the cloud itself. It leans toward yellow, so we'll run the yellow mask. Once the mask is run, just drag it onto the bar with the main image and the mask will be applied to the image. Now you can adjust the yellow color of the Cygnus wall without affecting the rest of the image. With the mask applied, we're now going to go back into the Curves Transformation tool. The Curves tool is very well executed and it allows us to selectively amplify or diminish red, green, and blue channels, or the traditional narrowband channels, as well as alpha and luminance. Here, we are going to work with the color channels to bring out the yellow, increase its saturation, and adjust it to a hue that we find pleasing. Once that's done, we're going to run the cyan mask to adjust some of the bluish hues that are found in the background cloud, largely to the left center and left upper portion of the nebula. Simply drag over the cyan mask icon directly onto the image and the mask will be created. I think this mask is a little over sharp, so I'm going to blur it, and that way the transitions that it creates will blend more subtly and desirably into the image. Once that is done, we're going to open up our Curves Transformation again. It really is an incredibly powerful tool, and you'll be using it a lot. And now we're going to adjust blue and some of the other color channels, and at the very end, the luminance to bring out the subtle shades of cyan and the contrast around it. This is a process that involves a lot of experimentation. You're going to try one thing, and then another, and another, so you find what is most visually appealing to you. There is no right or wrong answer, except that the right answer is what you find appealing. Well, I guess there could be a wrong answer. You're not going to want to apply so much color that you end up drowning out subtle shades of transition. If you see blocky changes in color or shadow and light anywhere, you've overdone it. All right, I've skipped ahead from playing around with the transformations a little bit. I think this is pretty good. With the sign adjusted the way that we want it, we're now going to remove that mask and run the blue mask, again taken from Bill's scripts. Remember to turn off the previous mask or you will not be able to apply the new one. Then simply drag the script over your image and the mask will run automatically. You may find the mask makes transitions that are too edged or sharp or harsh. If that's the case, run the blur mask over the color mask. You can run the blur mask repeatedly till it gets to where you want it. You can also apply the mask initially with no blurring as I'm doing here and then blur it later. That way you can make your changes and then blur it to taste and see the outcome immediately. I haven't said it already, but if you're unfamiliar with how to use masks in PixInsight, simply drag the mask tab onto the bar with the image tab. Don't place it right over the image tab, just drop it onto the same bar and the mask will be automatically applied. To see where the mask is covering, you can go up to the mask menu Click the drop down menu and click on show mask, but then you'll want to hide it again so you can actually work on the image. Now we're going to turn back to our curves transformation tool and further adjust those hues around blue. Now remember, every color is a combination of the three primary colors, 
So to get any one given color right, red, blue, or green, you're going to want to adjust the closest related color, but you're also going to adjust the other two primary colors until you get that red, blue, or green color you're trying to change just where you want it. Don't try to use color to adjust saturation. That's the intensity of a color. And don't try to use color to adjust brightness. That's your luminosity. So get your color where you want it and then adjust the intensity of the color and then adjust the luminosity. As with all histogram and curves transformation work, take your time, look at lots of variations, and don't stop till you've settled on what works for you. If you think you found a version that works for you, just save it and carry on working. You can create multiple versions and eventually save on the version that you like the most. Once the colors and the dynamic range, the contrast and the luminance within the mass are looking good, remove all the mass and then run another curves transformation. This time on global saturation and luminance, possibly the individual color channels if you want, and just further refine the light, shadow, and color of the image in total. Here you should be able to get it to be just about exactly where you want. Take your time and make small, gentle changes. Remember it takes PixInsight a moment to catch up to the changes that you've made. How long it takes depends mainly on your computer's processing power but make subtle changes until you have the image where you want. You want the contrast to stand out without being overwhelming and making blocky light to dark changes. Same with the colors. You want them to stand out without becoming chunky, overwhelming, blocky, or oversaturated, which gives them an artificial and gaudy look. This is looking pretty good. Now I'm going to save the final image and I'm going to move over to another photo editor for the final editing. In that editor, we're going to remove the star artifacts left by the star exterminator, make some final adjustments to the overall curves, and recomposite the stars. Why am I not using PixInsight? Well, the other editor is just frankly more powerful at those processes. You might choose to use something like Photoshop, but for me, I prefer Affinity Photo. Not least of which is because I said in the previous video, it gives you 99% of the functionality for a one-time price of $100, and very often it's on sale for half that. And quite frankly, it's better at removing objects than Photoshop is. Here we are in Affinity Photo, and I've linked them down below. By the way, I don't get any commissions for making any of these recommendations. I'm simply recommending software that I use because I found it to be powerful and I like it. But now that we are in Affinity Photo, we are going to select the Erase tool and just systematically erase all those bright, unwanted artifacts. We don't want them in the image at all when we recomposite the stars back in. With that portion of the task done, we're going to pop back into PixInsight and adjust the histogram on the stars plate. We want to bring up the brightness of the stars so they show up well, they're beautiful, but they are not over bright, thereby overwhelming the more delicate beauty of the nebula. As with all histogram work, this is just trial and error. However, for this part it's simpler. Just use the universal histogram option, working with all colors and luminance at the same time. Get the brightness of the stars up to where you find it's pleasing. And then save the star image. For Affinity Photo, you could save in pretty much any format that I can think of, including fits. However, I find it's just quicker and easier to work in TIFF files, which are very powerful and pretty much preserve all of the data that you would get in a fits. Affinity Photo seems to like working with TIFF files a bit more than FITS. You can most definitely use FITS files, they just require a little bit of adjustment when they're in Affinity Photo. So I just save them as TIFFs. Once back in Affinity Photo, as you can see here, I just open up the File Explorer and drag the star plate directly over the nebula image. As long as you haven't done any cropping so far, the star plate will fit over perfectly. That's why I save the cropping for last. Alternatively, you can crop the image in PixInsight after doing anything requiring image solving. It really has to be one or the other. If you crop before then, the image solver won't be able to work. If you crop somewhere in the middle of editing, it will be much more difficult and nearly impossible to perfectly align the stars back over the image. So align your stars either after image solving in PixInsight or during final cropping in Affinity Photo. So just drag and drop your star plate TIFF onto the Affinity Photo image, and then you're going to composite it. Affinity Photo has many, many composite options, and they allow you the ability to be very creative and can come up with some amazing or some ridiculous outcomes. It's also nice how when playing with all these options, you can see what the finished product would look like immediately. But generally, to composite the stars over the image, you want to select the Add or Screen option from the Composite drop-down menu. 
Add gives you a bit more brightness and luster in the stars. Screen mutes the stars a bit more. Here, I think giving the stars a bit more brightness and luster will be nice, so I'm going to go with the Add option. Now, I'm finally going to crop the image, so as to remove the garbled signal at the outer edges of the image. In my case, the reducer on my telescope works beautifully. The garbled signal doesn't have anything to do with warped stars. It's simply small errors created by the stacking and the dithering process. But we'll get it out the way, making the image yet more perfect and more beautiful. With the image stacked, I'm going to run yet another curves adjustment, this time in Affinity Photo, just to see if I can bring out a bit more sharpness in the contrast, develop the dynamic range a bit, and enhance the colors just a little bit. All of these changes are intended to be very subtle. I'm just taking some final steps to beautify the image. And then I'm going to use Affinity Photo's very powerful HSL tool to make some selective color changes within the image. I'd like to bring up the yellows a little bit, making them a bit more golden, and brighten up the blues overall, making them a bit more cyan, like the daytime sky. And after a couple minutes more adjustment, the finished product is this. An image almost as accurate, almost as beautiful, almost as noise-free, and almost as good, as that taken with a far more expensive cooled camera, whether OSC or narrowband, and without the additional cost of the expensive filters and filter wheel. Let's take a moment and compare this emulated narrowband image that I created to an actual narrowband image looking for accuracy. Here's one featured on Wikipedia. Which one's better? I'll have to leave you to decide. That's a subjective matter. But I do believe I can say with certainty that with the technology where it stands now, you can shoot astrophotography with an ordinary, uncooled color camera, otherwise known as an OSC or one-shot camera, that is just as good as a cooled monochrome camera with filters or a cooled one-shot color camera. The one accessory I would advise to make this happen is get a good dual or tri-band filter. But, as I said in the last video, and I'll repeat again, I think we are at the end of the age where we must have a cooled camera, and for that matter, a narrowband camera with filters, to get good images. And that reality makes astrophotography a whole lot more accessible to everyone. Because an uncooled, one-shot color camera costs about half what a cooled camera does, and about a quarter of what a monochrome cooled camera with a narrowband filter setup costs. Alright, mic dropped. Get out there and enjoy imaging the stars.